what makes this Australian park so radically innovative is that it's not simply an open-air botanical garden. It revolutionizes the very genre and art of the garden itself. All of Australia is related here. Cranbourne's 25 hectares house a 20-year-old collection of plants emblematic of the continent. Let's meet the people who've turned this place into an amazing hotspot of biodiversity. There are six of them, and they form the Australian Gardens Green Team. Perry, the landscape designer, Edwina, the visual artist, John, the gardener, Paul, the botanical expert, Professor Sue Ann, and Chris, the man in charge. We have 25,000 different plant species in Australia. Many of them are new ones are being discovered. It's a vast continent from deserts to snow-capped mountains and wetland areas and coastal areas. So to have a, a new garden that embraces all of that diversity in an artistic, a new style that isn't based on the European design styles is really exciting. It's time for Australia to, to have this and help us on our journey of, of national development. It's not driven by botany. This is driven by uh, culture and art. It's an interpretation of a continent. We didn't want to copy. Um, it wasn't trying to mimic these landscapes. It was trying to capture the essence, the distillation of, these, of this landscape. And so it's our impression. It's our sort of artistic idea of what these landscapes represent. Um, and so we're trying to convey to the visitors, look at this landscape and hopefully see these landscapes in the natural environment in a new way. From the red hue to the most extravagant texture, here's the story of a work of art which sprung straight from its creators' minds. Well, when we arrived at the site, this was a, a former sand mine, so it's just pure sand. And what was here was what's called a perch lake. Um, the groundwater had risen to form a lake in the sand. And it was quite pretty. Um, and we thought, is this the right experience when you come to the Australian Garden, to have a pretty blue lake? Um, and we said, no, we should actually fill that in and make it a desert. It is the iconic and quintessential part of our greater landscape. It dominates our continent. And we thought that's the best story to tell for a visitor to come to a botanic garden about Australia. It is a bit of a risk. Um, uh, there's not too many gardens that arrive at a huge, red, empty landscape that has very few plants in it. But it's important to tell that story. It's important to have a confronting view, to say, this is our dominant landscape. This is what Australia is about. It's a dry, red and mysterious continent. We were inspired by um, artists such as Fred Williams, who is a, a beautiful um, Australian landscape painter. And what he did is convey the colour, the form, um, the patterning of our broader landscapes in a very stylized and abstracted way. This whole garden is, in, in a way, an attempt to respect and to love our broader landscape and, in a way, to inspire visitors to see our flora and our landscapes in new ways. You will see on the right-hand side of the sand garden are things called lunettes, which are repeated sculpted landforms, which are formed by um, windborne sands um, edging up on the deserts. And you'll see that they're parallel lines, and that actually accentuates depth and scale. The other technique is the silver circles that you see there. Each one of them diminish in scale the further the view goes on. And that gives a sense of depth, even though it actually is a quite a, a defined space. Circles of light grey are scattered across the graphic, chromatic, red and ochre expanse. The Japanese-inspired discs dotting the incandescent swathe are formed by bushes called Ragodia spinescence. These desert-resistant plants are covered with tiny salt crystals, reminiscent of a bygone era when countless paleo lakes covered the continent. Our visual artist Edwina drew inspiration from the salt flats to create a work of art. 
the red sand garden is a very simple aesthetic and we thought having the contrast was going to make a bolder statement. So we've actually put a, or an iron surface underneath so that when it, where the glaze peels back, you actually get that iron colour coming through. And you'll also, we wanted to create a sense of, rather than just being a flat surface, creating a, a memory of animals or wind that may have gone across it. So here we've put some marks across it. Could be in reference to a kangaroo popping across it or wind going across or something getting caught in it, just so that created a bit of a history to the ceramic work as well. A lot of Australians actually spend their lives on the fringes of Australia, and that's where most of the population lives. So a lot of people haven't travelled into central Australia at all. So when I had the opportunity to go there in my late 20s and driving through the desert, I don't know what it was. I just, I love the colours, the, you know, the, the red dirt with the really soft silver grey plants. I was just very attracted to that sensibility. First the flamboyant desert, then the bush. Both dry and verdant, it symbolises wild and untamed forests. It's the other powerful image of Australia, covering 800,000 square kilometres of land from Melbourne to Sydney in willowy forests of elegant swaying eucalypts and scrubby bushes. This graceful foliage is found in the west of the garden along the eucalypt walk. We wanted to contrast the openness of the sand garden with the immersion of the eucalypt walk. You enter into the eucalypt walk and you're immersed and covered uh, within a very textured and dense landscape experience and come across a whole range of different experiences to relate to the various eucalypt forests that are found within the Australian continent. The eucalypts are the quintessential tree of our Australian landscape. Any botanic garden that's trying to represent um, the Australian landscape has to have a very large component of um, eucalypts within it. Um, we really wanted to accentuate the particular qualities of the eucalypt forest, and one of them is textures. Um, the trunk forms of particular gum trees are absolutely gorgeous. But then if you walk through what we call the peppermint gums through the eucalypt walk, it's another sensory experience. This is where the smells of the eucalypt walk come into play. You walk through that landscape and suddenly the aroma of the eucalypts come into play and you, you think, wow, that's a very powerful experience. And it's not visual, it's another sense. This exceptional collection of eucalypts contains a design that didn't go unnoticed by Perry, our landscape artist. Tiny scrawling scribbles created by larvae feeding on the bark of scribbly gums. An almost insignificant pattern, yet one that resembles a very haute couture motif. In the conversation through the design process, we said, well, we should actually have scribbly gums represented in this uh, Euclid book. And I can remember thinking, wow, that has a very beautiful pattern. What if we actually use that pattern to create a pathway? And so we were inspired by a very tiny little um, pattern and made it a very large experience for the visitor. The Australian garden can be seen like a Japanese garden um, in which they have represented their landscape in a particular way. They've stylized it, they've abstracted it, they symbolize their landscape. They're capturing the mood of a country within two or three metres. And that's a beautiful aesthetic art form that they've, they've done over centuries. And we're just trying in our very humble way to do it in a similar way to capture the beauty of our country. What makes this garden so unique is that it perfectly combines Australian history with the art of Japanese gardens, as seen in this bridge. The lily pad bridge is another stylized rendition of Australian nature, the billabong, an Aboriginal word for the small ponds of water formed when a river changes course. The dead pools house a myriad of water lilies, whose leaves are depicted here in an oversized fashion. We're defined by droughts and we're defined by floods. And so we felt that water um, had to be a very important narrative within the Australian garden. We've used it as a device um, to take visitors on a journey from the arid country where their water is scarce 
to abundance, the coastal edge. So water is a way of taking people on a journey metaphorically through our broader landscape, but physically through the Australian garden as well. The Northern Display Gardens, where we have a lovely water feature, is in many ways at the end of the journey of water. It's representative of the more populated eastern seaboard of Australia, but on the coastal fringes, they're much more created landscapes. They've been landscaped, uh, developed, changed. They're much more urbanised, so the style of the garden reflects that contrast. And what's beautiful about those uh, those landscapes is when you see the fluid movement of sand over time um, in this landscape. And they have some very beautiful fluid shapes. Um, also part of these landscapes are often things called malaleucas, which are paperbark trees, which are uh, here behind us. The malaleuca spits are forming the transition between the river systems and our coastal environments. We've chosen a malaleuca because that is a typical plant, one of the few typical plants that occur along the coast of Australia. We're not really interpreting uh, with this garden an ecosystem as such. It, it is interpreting a character. It's a very modern interpreted form uh, where, where they're pruned. They're being pruned like big bonsais. What the Royal Botanic Gardens wanted to do was to show off the plants in, in different settings. Australia was colonised from England and Europe, and with that colonisation came that whole design sense. I mean, you see in Australian home gardens a lot of use of European plants, which is fine. I have no problem with that. But there's a, a great opportunity to utilise much more of the, the, the native flora of Australia, and really that was lacking. One human has lived here for 18 years, since the creation of this unique place. His days are more of a delight than his nights, so attentive is he to this paradise. Meet John Arnott, the patron saint of gardeners. It is fundamentally a collaboration between some really interesting design and some, some really clever horticulture. And, and it's those two things coming together. Uh, look, I think the garden is full of, of plants which are challenging to grow for a whole host of reasons. Um, we, with this amount of diversity, you know, we've got you know, 2,000 plant species uh, associated with this garden. So some things are going to be beautifully matched to these conditions and they'll fry and they'll be relatively easy to grow. Other things are a little bit more challenging. And, and, but that's one of the beautiful things about this garden. It's a garden where we can um, take risks and we can experiment and we can explore you know, the various tolerances of a whole range of plants from a long way away from their natural ecosystems. I think that is one of the roles of botanic gardens, is to push boundaries and experiment. Yeah, these will need a, a good drink, because it's a little bit dry. Here's a group of grass trees, uh, Xanthorea species. Uh, and Xanthoreas are unique to Australia, so they're found in no other place. As with a lot of Australian plants, they're, they're really well adapted to um, surviving fire. And you can see just here from the trunks that these, these beautiful old, old, old trunks, you can see they're blackened by the bushfire. Um, and what, what happens is it, it, the, the fire will come off the ground and it'll come up the stems and it'll actually ignite the, the whole of the canopy of the tree. And, and after fire has gone through areas of the bush, you'll see thousands and thousands and thousands of these flower spikes, almost to the horizon.
An Australian vegetation is a vegetation of great subtlety. Its beauty is in its minutia, the tiny little myriad of things that occur there. It's not a brash vegetation, it's not a brash landscape. The other particularity of this garden is its eccentricity, and especially the singularity of its varieties. We're still in Australia, but 600 million years ago, in the cold, damp climate of a supercontinent, Gondwana. The landmass included Africa, South America, Madagascar, Antarctica, and of course, Australia. When it broke up 160 million years ago, Australia didn't move, which explains why its plant life has remained so unusual. So you can see this curling out here, and have a look in here. The female produces the orange seeds, so it's a wonderful form, isn't it? I can, I can take that off, and you can see what it, what it looks like. It does look like an old form, doesn't it? Sort of a thing, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. This sort of garden is really about trees. Uh, and, and it's about some other ancient things that exist in that sort of space, such as the cycads. That's some of the uh, original flora in the ancient, ancient uh, uh, plant forms when dinosaurs uh, roamed the earth. It's about prehistoric plants and plants that we know that have survived for a number of years. You feel like you're in a tropical, lush Jurassic Park landscape. On the other side, it's, it's kind of ethical in, in thinking about how we've treated the planet since we've come along. We wanted to manipulate the landform, the ground in this garden. Gondwana was a very tectonic ancient landform. And so we've used pathways. Um, they are crusty and rough and textured. So we're trying to evoke the qualities of sort of tectonic plates in a very small garden experience. So uh, w what I think I should show you is the, the wool of my pine. And it's, it's such a fascinating plant. It's probably the last significant ancient plant to be found in this country. And uh, here, here it is, you can see the examples of the two different fruiting bodies, and it doesn't produce flowers. The Woolamai pine is part of the fossil flora, and it's fairly recently discovered in the Blue Mountain, Sydney. And so every one that you, you find of these plants is a clone of the other. So genetically, it's, it's still one, although it looks like a forest of trees, and we don't know where this is. It's a big, big secret <laughs> when I think, here I am as a designer, working with something that has been evolved for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, that's, that's a pretty astounding thing to think about. The Australian garden, in a way, was designed to convey a whole variety of stories. One of the most rewarding parts of the gardens is actually its playful qualities how children and families have used this garden in ways that we never imagined. In the heart of the garden, we discover another surrealistic landscape, a maze. But rather than opting for the tall hedges that traditionally form dividers, here the designers have used large segments of rock. Tucked among the stone is a genuine cabinet of curiosities, Cranbourne's Pandora's box. The weird and wonderful garden is a secret garden. And it is something that you discover um, as you walk through this garden experience. It was designed to host the really particular, beautiful, weird and wonderful flora of our continent, whether it's very delicate forms or very sculptural um, and textural plant forms. And we needed a garden to convey the beauty of these weird and wonderful plants.
because of the, the use of the stone, where, where, where sometimes it shades and has cool places, sometimes it's, it's very hot because it stores heat. So what we could do within that sort of space is create a, a lot of microclimates. That's a whole lot of different growing conditions which we didn't have elsewhere. You can see the biodiversity, it's visually apparent there. It is explained to you where some of these plants come from. You start to understand how tough and how resilient a lot of this flora is, because juxtaposed uh, one against another can be something that comes from an arid space, is something that comes from perhaps a wetted alpine area. centre point of the garden. It's, it's the, the middle. It's just as dramatic as the red sand garden. It's just not screaming, look at me, look at me. It's screaming, be in me, be in me. It invites you in. It's sculptural. It doesn't look like the centre of Australia, but it, it, it looks interesting. It looks mysterious. It looks curious. And because of that, people come into it and, and they get to see this whole other world. Sometimes it's a little bit like being on the moon or Mars maybe, but it, it's because of this kind of richness of textures and oddity that it kind of works. At the heart of the maze stands a majestic bottle tree. We can't help but think of a labyrinth of love with its concentric circles radiating out around a bungalow or tree. Often it's an apple tree, in reference to the Garden of Eden. Here, the tree symbolizes longevity and peace, harmony between man and nature. There are two distinct elements to the Australian garden. We have, we have the garden here, um, but we also have the, the surrounding conservation zone. Um, and the, the conservation zone is very much about biodiversity conservation and wildlife. Um, and this is very much about display. Melbourne is a, a large city and it's getting bigger every year. It's expanding like many main capital cities across the world. Um, and so the gardens here means that we are able to protect it into the future. We're getting surrounded by housing as the years go by. That adds extra challenges for us in terms of how we manage that. But it means that our role into the future of conserving the natural bushland area is increasingly important. I really hope that the structure that is here at the moment remains for many years, perhaps 100 as the Botanic Art Gardens asked us to do. Oh, I expect I'll come back here as a grandfather and see the garden in a whole different state of maturity, of realising the vision of the design. It's something that is a never-ending journey. So even if I don't work here for another 20 years, it'll still be a very um, close thing within my heart. Mm -hmm.